On August 7th, 1942, an initial force of some 7,000 Marines landed on Guadalcanal and surrounding islands of the British Solomon Islands, the beginning of a grueling six-month-long campaign that would eventually cost more than 30,000 casualties on all sides. Ten days after that initial invasion, a newly formed type of Marine unit was sent on a daring raid that would challenge both the tactics and the volunteers of what has been described as the United States' first special operation force. The August 1942 raid on Macon Island by the 2nd Battalion of the Marine Raiders is history that deserves to be remembered. The inspiration for the Marine Raiders were the British commandos, special units that had been equipped and trained to conduct raids on German-occupied Europe. In the Pacific, Admiral Chester Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, requested units trained and equipped to make raids on the numerous lightly defended Japanese-held islands. The 1st and 2nd Raider Battalions were created in February 1942 by order of the President, acting on a proposal by Wild Bill Donovan, the legendary officer who would go on to lead the Office of Strategic Services. The Raider Battalions specialized in conducting small unit amphibious rubber boat insertions, light infantry warfare, and executing independent raids behind Japanese lines. Central to the formation of the Raiders was an innovative officer, Major Evans Carlson. Carlson had served in the Army in the Mexican Punitive Expedition in 1916 and 17, and then in France during the Great War. He left the Army in 1922 and enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1923, and had earned the Navy Cross in Nicaragua in 1930. Between 1936 and 1938, he'd served as an intelligence officer in China, acting as an observer with the Chinese forces fighting the Imperial Japanese Army. He had not only learned about Japanese army tactics, but had been impressed by guerrilla tactics used by the Chinese Communist forces fighting them. His experience led him to resign his commission in 1939 in order to travel in the United States, writing and lecturing about the dangers of Japanese aggression in the Far East. Carlson rejoined the Marines after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. There were misgivings within the military establishment. Carlson had been sympathetic to the Chinese Communists and had distinctive leftward political leanings. But Carlson had first-hand experience fighting the Japanese army, and more importantly, he had the ear of the president. In 1933, Carlson had commanded the Marine Detachment in Warm Springs, Georgia, where FDR vacationed. There he had formed a relationship with both the president and FDR's oldest son, James Roosevelt. He was able to leverage that relationship both to aid in the proposal to create the Marine Raiders, which was opposed by some core traditionalists, but also to be appointed commander of the 2nd Raiders Battalion despite concerns about his politics. James Roosevelt, then a captain in the Marine Corps, was made Carlson's second-in-command. The Raider battalions were created from volunteers and given special equipment. The 1st Battalion, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Merritt Edson, trained along traditional lines of Marine organization and discipline, and pioneered landing tactics using the newly designed high-speed transports created from modified World War I four-stacker destroyers. Given his experience with the Chinese Communist forces, Carlson took a less traditional approach. He created a force that was less hierarchical, focusing on team building and something called ethical indoctrination that stressed to his men what they were fighting for and why. He also changed the structure of the Marine organization. Traditionally, the basic fighting unit had been an eight-man squad. Carlson instead used ten-man squads that consisted of a squad leader and three fire teams. Because of the nature of jungle warfare, his fire teams were built around volume of fire, with each team including a man armed with a Browning automatic rifle, a man armed with a Taunton submachine gun, and a man armed with an M1 rifle. To his unit, Carlson emphasized the term gung-ho, which he'd gotten in China. In Chinese industrial cooperatives, the word gung-ho roughly meant working together, although the American pronunciation and meaning was actually quite different than the way that it was used in China. Eventually, the term was adopted throughout the Marine Corps, represented spirit and enthusiasm. Edson's 1st Raider Battalion were among the first to land as part of the Guadalcanal campaign on August 7th, landing on the island of Tulagi. They saw distinguished service in the campaign, notably in the September 1942 Battle of Edson's Ridge. But Carlson's 2nd Raiders were assigned to an operation that would test the philosophy of these new types of units. They were to raid a small, lightly defended island in the Gilbert Island chain, then called Macon Island. Part of a small atoll in the Gilbert chain, Macon Island was exactly what Nimitz had meant when he described lightly defended Japanese-held islands. First occupied by the Japanese in December 1941, the island was the location of a Japanese seaplane base. The seaplanes would conduct long-range reconnaissance, and the tiny island held a mixed force of only some 70 defenders responsible for tending the floatplanes. 
Guam and the Aleutian island of Attu had also been considered for the raid, but both were too heavily defended and too far away from the Solomons to likely draw reinforcements from Guadalcanal. 211 Marines of the 2nd Marine Battalion were to embark on two submarines, USS Argonaut and USS Nautilus, land on the island via rubber boats, and attempt to defeat the Japanese garrison, gather intelligence, and destroy the facility and its aircraft. Raider Ben Carson noted that the raiders had never trained on a submarine, and most had never been on one before the raid. The hope was that the attack would draw Japanese forces away from the Solomon Islands in the Guadalcanal campaign. The raid was scheduled for August 17th, 10 days after the initial invasion of Guadalcanal. The raid experienced difficulties from the outset. The raiders were embarking on LCRLs, or landing craft, rubber, large. The rafts held 10 men were powered by outboard motors. The plan had been to load the men in boats and then have the submarines submerged beneath them. But the morning of the 16th, after a nine-day journey from Pearl Harbor, the raiders were confronted by rough seas with high swells and rain. It took much longer to prepare and load the boats than it had been in training, and some boats with equipment and supplies were washed away. Instead of being able to load everyone and have the submarine submerged beneath them, the boats had to be lowered over the side of the submarine. In the rough surf, the onboard motors became swamped. The Marines were forced to paddle in the surf. Carson said the whole thing was a confused mess. The Marines arrived on the island in a confused state with equipment losses and the heavy surf. Carson described the night as as dark as the inside of a black cow. A Marine from Company A accidentally discharged his weapon, potentially jeopardizing the entire operation. There were boats missing, including the boat carrying Lieutenant Oscar Petrus, the commander of B Company. The raiders were originally supposed to land at two beaches, but Carlson recognized the difficulty in the high surf and decided to land all the raiders on a single beach. The order had been given by word of mouth, but Petrus's boat had become separated from the others and, in the confusion, didn't get the message. The twelve men made it to the second beach, only to find themselves the only ones there. The rest of the raiders had landed on the other beach, designated Beach Z. They had hidden their rafts, camouflaging them with palm fronds. The situation was confused. The advanced element under Sergeant Clyde Thomason had deployed to defend the landing beach, but some groups from Company B, originally intended from the other landing beach, had moved off on their own towards their original objectives. Carlson radioed the Nautilus, noting the disorganized landing. He described the situation as lousy. As dawn broke, he was able to better organize his raiders, and they started moving inland. They encountered island natives who were friendly and described the location of the Japanese garrison. As they moved inland, they started to run into sniper fire. Sergeant Thomason, who was at six foot four inches, too tall for raiders' requirements and had to get a waiver to join the unit, at one point dauntlessly walked up to a house which concealed an enemy Japanese sniper, forced in the door, and shot the man before he could resist. As they moved towards the Japanese base, men of Company A spotted a truck carrying Japanese soldiers. Dean Winters of A Company was carrying a boy's anti-tank rifle. The British-made .55-inch rifle was popularly referred to as the elephant gun. He said, I hit the deck, braced myself, and fired, hitting the truck in the radiator. Steam poured out, and several Japs tumbled out. More Japanese soldiers arrived on foot, and Sergeant Thomason arranged his squad in a horseshoe formation, preparing for a Japanese attack. The Japanese charged with their bayonets fixed to cross open ground, one of the dreaded bonsai charges. Thomason's squad was well prepared, cut them down. The Japanese opened up with machine guns, the platoon moved to flank them. The platoon took casualties, but silenced the guns. The action was over in 30 minutes. The raiders were exhausted and had taken casualties. The raiders were still pinned down by sniper fire. Sergeant Thomason, who had served an enlistment in the Marines between 1934 and 1939 and had re-enlisted after Pearl Harbor, was killed by a sniper. He had exposed himself to fire to draw fire away from his men. The snipers were targeting squad leaders, radio operators, and even medics who removed the Red Cross armband so as not to be targets. The raiders became bogged down by snipers in what became known as the Battle of the Breadfruit Trees. At Roosevelt's orders, the Argonaut and Nautilus used their duck guns to sink two vessels in the harbor, a transport, and a gunboat. The vessels were sunk, but it wasn't clear if the transport had been carrying troops, and if so, what had become of them. Carlson could no longer be sure of the size of the force that he was facing. Some snipers snuck through the perimeter, attacking the Raider Command and Aid Post. James Roosevelt was at the post directing operations as Carlson had moved forward to encourage his men. At one point, Roosevelt himself had returned fire against the snipers and received a light wound. While Carlson and Roosevelt were dealing with snipers, Lieutenant Petros and his men had moved forward and found themselves in the enemy's rear. They destroyed a vehicle and some ammunition, the base radio station, and killed eight enemy. 
unbeknownst to them, one of those they killed was Sergeant Major Kizaburo Kenamitsu, the Japanese commander. Piotras' squad had taken three men killed, two more wounded. Not able to make contact with Carlson, Piotras took his men back to the beach to evacuate to the submarines. A group of Japanese aircraft arrived, forcing Argonaut and Nautilus to dive. They bombed and strafed the Marines. Two seaplanes landed in the lagoon. The Marines opened fire with machine guns and anti-tank rifles. The smaller plane, uh, Nakajima E-8N Dave, caught fire as it taxied. The larger plane, the uh, Kawanishi H-8K Emily, capable of carrying up to 40 troops, tried to take off to avoid the raider's fire. Took off too steeply, stalled, and crashed. Both planes were destroyed, but Carlson could not tell if any reinforcements had made it off the crashed Emily. Under air and sniper attack, unaware of how many enemy he was still facing, and knowing the Japanese would be able to reinforce the garrison sometime, Carlson decided to withdraw. The plan was to uncover the boats and escape to the submarines under cover of darkness. But again, the waves were high and the surf powerful. Only a few of the boats and 80 men, including Lieutenant Piotras, made it back to the submarines. Raider Ray Baum recalled, There were about 10 of us paddling out over the breakers and we were tipped over three times before we got past them. You can't believe when there is danger how you respond to it. The current was pulling us back, but we somehow made it to the sub. But Carlson and about 120 raiders could not make it through the surf. What's more, in the attempt, they'd become exhausted and had lost most of their equipment. Only 20 men who had served as a rear guard were still fully armed. Carlson was unable to raise either submarine on the radio and did not know if it, they had been sunk or forced to withdraw by the air attack. In fact, the Japanese garrison was nearly annihilated, but Carlson could not know that. By some accounts, in a desperate situation, Carlson made the difficult decision to surrender. A Marine was able to track down a single Japanese sailor, and they handed him a note to take back to his command. But the surrender attempt failed, as the Japanese sailor was apparently shot by another raider who didn't know what mission he was on. But many raiders dispute that that ever happened, arguing, among other things, that Carlson never would have surrendered a unit that included President Roosevelt's son. And there's no mention of an attempt to surrender in the after-action reports. The raiders spent a dismal night, but in the morning they were able to raise Argonaut on the radio. A number of Marines, including Major Roosevelt, were able to make it to the submarines, and Lieutenant Pietras carried a message to Carlson with a plan to evacuate the rest of the raiders that evening. It was a dangerous plan, as the Japanese might bring reinforcements at any time. But the submarines could not be caught in the open during the day with Japanese planes on the prowl. Carlson and his remaining 70 or so men counted their casualties and paid the local police chief to bury the raiders dead. They also located and burned more than a thousand barrels of aviation fuel. By lashing their rafts together and with the assistance of two native outrigger canoes, the remaining raiders, many of them wounded, made it back to the submarines that evening. There's still disagreement over whether the raid was a success or a failure. Despite the obstacles, the raiders had managed to annihilate the garrison on Macon Island. They had sunk two boats, destroyed two seaplanes, burned a thousand barrels of airplane fuel, and despite the fact that they didn't capture any Japanese prisoners, they had captured intelligence in their headquarters that included details on the defenses of Japanese bases throughout the Pacific. While the raid does not seem to have achieved its primary objective of diverting reinforcements from Guadalcanal, the raid was a propaganda victory that improved morale at a time when war news was desperate for the nation. The raiders' surgeon, Dr. Steven Stigler, recalled that when the raiders reached Pearl Harbor, by the time we got abreast of the first ship, they were out on deck, standing at attention, saluting us. Each ship we passed saluted us. They were playing the Marine Corps hymn, and they were cheering. It was all very emotional. The impact of the raid on U.S. morale was reinforced by the 1943 release of a film about the battle called Gung Ho, the story of Carlson's Macon Island Raiders. In all, the Raiders listed 18 men killed in combat and 12 missing. Nine of the 12 missing were apparently from a raft that had become separated on the last day. In the evacuation, there had been no way to do an accurate head count, and Carlson had assumed that those men had been picked up by the other submarine. Those nine men were captured alive and eventually executed by beheading. In 1947, Japanese Admiral Koso Abe was convicted of war crimes for their execution and was sentenced to death by hanging. Macon Island was retaken from the Japanese in the November 1943 Battle of Macon Island. There was an attempt at the time to find the graves of the Marines who had died in the raid, but the location of the graves were not located at that point, and in fact the mass grave wasn't found clear until 1999. Through the use of DNA, the Marines were able to identify the 18 raiders who had been killed in combat and one of the Marines that had been listed as missing in action. Six of the sets of remains were sent back to families for burial, and the rest were buried in Arlington National Cemetery.
For the raid on Macon Island, Carlson was awarded his second Navy Cross. Major Roosevelt and Lieutenant Petros were also given that award. Sergeant Clyde Thomason was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. He was the first Marine of the Second World War to be awarded that medal. A Buckley-class destroyer escort that was commissioned in 1943 was named the USS Thomason in his honor. In 1944, a Casablanca-class escort carrier was named the USS Macon Island in honor of the raid on Macon Island, and that was followed up in 2006 by a WASP-class amphibious assault ship. The motto of the USS Macon Island is, of course, gung-ho. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guys, where it's snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.